Welcome to the very first showing of Straight Talk, one-on-one -on -one conversations with newsmakers and opinion shapers. I am Zafar Subhan, editor of Dhaka Tribune. Today my guest is Afsan Chaudhary, journalist, teacher, writer and historian who has helped shape public opinion and public discourse for decades with his penetrating socio-political analysis and landmark work as a chronicler of Bangladesh's War of Independence. Afsan always has something interesting to say and always has an insightful take on the issues of the day. Welcome to the show, Mr. Afsan Chod. Afsan, let's start with the burning issue of the day and that, of course, is uh, the alliance between Dr. Kamal Hussain and his Jatiyo Oiko front and the BNP. What do you make of this and what impact do you think it will have on the politics in the upcoming election here in Bangladesh? Mm. Thanks. I think these are two associated but not necessarily um, interdependent. Okay. One is the alliance itself. Yes. And I think the alliance is interesting because Dr. Kamal Hussain, who mm -hmm. the, f the person who basically wrote the constitution, That's right. is, is understood to be with BNP, which according to Army League is somebody who violated the constitution. So for them, there is a political advantage. But for the BNP, I see this is an advantage for the BNP rather than for Dr. Kamal Hussain, because BNP needed a figure who was a little less controversial, let us say, than Khalid Azia, now in jail, and Tariq Zia, who has already been convicted in a serious crime uh, in a trial. So getting Kamal Hussain is big for them because yes. the father figure and he is a father And he's figure. a respected figure respected across figure. the boards politically, yeah. socially. At the same time, you know, so if you look at Army League's attack on the front, it focuses not so much on BNP. It focuses on Kamal Hussain. Yeah. With Kamal Hussain, how could you do this? Kamal Hussain, you want to implement uh, Bongo Bundhu's ideals with the party which actually they hold responsible for the killing of Bongo Bundhu? How can you be doing this? How can you be talking right, this? Right, that's certainly and their position. So. So, for Army League, at the same time, we don't know how the public is taking this. Yeah. For example, the Jamaat thing is more or less gone, and people are not talking about Jamaat Islami now. Sure. Yeah. So, they have managed to kill that. But for Army League, they are going to focus much more now on Kamal Hussein uh, coming together with BNP, yeah. now, which means that the older equation, the BNP Army League, that remains. Yeah. But at the same time, the new factor has made BNP a little more respectable. Army League has to accept this, yeah. which is why actually Army League is going for all this statement. So the focus is, this is not an honest alliance. This is a dishonest alliance of convenience, so mm. and so forth, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So they're putting in a lot more effort in putting up a counter alliance. Do you think that's going to have, what is the ultimate impact going to be on elections at the end of the year, if any, and then beyond? I think it's, it, may, it has, if you look at the way Army League was treating BNP till yeah. Dr. Kamal Hussain joined, yeah. was uh, no space, no opportunity, no yeah. nothing, I'll give you 53 more cases and so on and so forth. Have a, Dr. Kamal Hussain coming in has created a little more space for the BNP. The Silit meeting is significant because... You right, know, and there's going to be another one in Chittagong. Yeah, in Chittagong, and wherever they will go. Kamal Hussain still remains a mm -hmm. big figure, big person. Kamal yeah. Hussain is not Moinul Hussain. I mean, this yeah. is something people of should course. accept. So Kamal Hussain has been able to give that little sense of respectability. And people are not talking so much of Khalid Azia, Tariq Zia. Mm -hmm. That person, the Khalid Tariq thing is right. less. So, but whether this equation, the absence of Tariq and Khalid is actually going to help BNP a little bit. Yeah. But we don't know about voter behavior. If I think HT Imam said that 42% for Army League and 32% for BNP, I would say if you will listen to the Army League narrative, you wouldn't think it's a 10% difference that they're talking about. It's a 50%, 70% difference. Right, and the 10% difference is what he's willing to say in public. Yeah, yeah. And so which means that the voters are not judging this by the political equations that are coming up. The sure. voters are making up their own mind. Yeah. And I think this is the major issue which we underestimate is that the voters are far more alienated from political parties than you would like to think. Poli political parties are by, about, home, for, etc. of politicians. 
Um, right. I mean, one of the things which you've always said is that, you know, uh, when I've spoken with you in the past on this, is actually the moving from Awami League to BNP for Dr. Kamal Hussain, for instance, is by people in the political sphere seems to be a huge thing. They're on opposite ends of the political spectrum, but that's just the political spectrum. You know, actually, AL and BNP are not necessarily that different if you look at them in the scheme of the country. And maybe, you know, they both represent, you know, the same stream of political thought they both come from the same place, uh, from a socio-economic level, and who their core uh, supporters are. I mean, maybe you know the game has moved beyond Awami League BNP. I don't know. I mean, is that something for us to be thinking about? You know, after these elections, in the in uh, the next five or ten years in the country. Thanks. I think I think this issue about the, mm, the class factor mm. on the socio-economic reality, as you just said, is very important. With something which escapes the politicians, because they are used to seeing things around Army League, BNP, and mm -hmm. etc., etc., and Jama. The point is, structurally speaking, structural analysis wise, yeah. this two political parties plus half political party is the, what is called the civil society group, which Dr. Kamal right. Hussain leads. Absolutely. And these people do come from more or less the same cluster. Dr. Kamal Hussain comes from the older generation. Sure. That generation doesn't exist in Army League actually. There is no one in Army League who was at that time active with Dr. Kamal Hussain. So, Sheikh Hasina and all others, they actually come from the subsequent generation, the next generation. Sure. They are the new elite. Yes. They have no loyalty to the memories of 1972 to 75. For Hasina, it's very clear that she is holding up the legacy of Army League as it exists, rather than the Army League of 1972. Sure. Kamal Hussain. Well, the country has changed yes, as well, in absolutely. any case. Yes. And, uh, you know, one of the things I've always thought is that ultimately the challenge which the Army League is going to face is really not going to be from the BNP, because I think the problem Army League faces ultimately in Bangladesh is, you know, it started off as a middle class party. party. You see, and it, it's a middle class urban party, but um, BNP is even more so. You see, and ultimately, I think <laughs> I think power is moving away from the urban elites. Power is moving away from you know the the elite classes. It's moving to the mafassal. It's moving to the lower middle class, to the more rural population in Bangladesh. And I think BNP doesn't actually represent those people. And I think for that reason, I don't see them providing much of a challenge long term to the Awami League. I think the challenge is going to come from there. Uh, if you take the structural analysis of power in yeah. Bangladesh, you would see there are four. Uh, layers of power in Bangladesh. Okay. At the top is the army. Sure, the army course. is unchangeable. The army is not affected by politics. And Absolutely. Yeah. Second comes uh, the business community. Of and they're course. very strong and they have become stronger with every regime. They have become very strong during this regime. Yes. And they are ones who are actually on both sides of the fence. Of course. For them, the money making is what matters. So yeah. for them, those where they can do business, well, they happy. will be there, and I think yeah. they already have alliances with both sides sure. of the party. The third comes would be the in the amlas, the bureaucrats. Yeah, the bureaucrats are playing a slightly risky game, and I okay. think Sheikh Hasina understands that because she's been offering a lot of carrots to the uh, um, bureaucrats, knowing that look, you got to, you are, I am taking care of you. Remember, you, the, the IOUs are there. I mean, she yeah. has given them all the benefit. Fourth, and I think this is the weakest part of the power structure, are the okay. politicians, ah. because they get changed. Sure. So this, if it's at all a conflict, the conflict is about the internal power structure of the ruling class. Right. It has, doesn't have much the to do with the politicians come and go. The other part, as you mentioned, and I think this is something we tend to ignore in our discussions, is that the rise of the rural areas. Yeah. This is so so obvious. I mean, okay, there is acute disparity and all sorts of problems. Mm -hmm. But having worked in rural poverty alleviation, I know for sure things have improved very dramatically in the last 15, 20 years. Absolutely. A lot of the credit goes to this current government. Sure. And therefore, you have also created your problem there. One, you have created a well-off rural middle class well off upper class also, but the upper class is small in number, the middle class is there. This middle class is a very traditional middle class, rural middle class, and the connection with this rural middle class with the mass culture is strong. Yes. Except that, face it, as you said, the urban middle class doesn't understand the transitions that are taking place in Bangladesh society. Yeah. Amilik does, yeah. or at least Sheikh Hasina does. I think she does, yeah, yes. And, and she has been able to 
take care of this rural middle class better than any politician did. I mean, in my work in 1971, I see Sheikh Mujib's seventh March speech is the most historic event in the politics of villages because it was basically transitioning society from the old traditional uh, Muslim League versus, uh, let's say, Army League was then emerging. It was not fully emergent in the rural areas. Muslim League and anti-Muslim League, whatever. 7th March changed that because 7th March brought entire Bangladesh under one cover and right. this cover was the speech. And this is electrifying to think that you had villages which had never been interested in politics suddenly realizing I am a political entity. This is why. Now, Hasina, like her dad, understands the power of the rural areas. Bangladesh yeah. would not have been independent if the villages didn't exist. Cities did not make Bangladesh free. Well, the, yeah, the we barely had any city yeah, dwellers back yeah, in 1971. Yeah, exactly. And even today, I mean, mm -hmm. actually numerically, and if you, and if you talk about in terms of power, and, um, uh, and wealth, that's of course moving yes. that and way. And this is where the politics is. Yeah. Hasina reads it much better than anyone else. Okay. She's been to it. BNP, unfortunately, as you said, BNP is uh, put together. I would say BNP began in 1957 when Army League and NAP broke up. So if you talk to the BNP leaders, you'll find a lot of them are old uh, NAP uh, uh, activists. And a lot of them are those who are more like have come in recently. There used to be a lot more Jamaatis and Muslim leaguers, but now they are a little less, particularly after the war crimes trial. Super. But essentially, it is doesn't. It is got the fringe element in it. It's it is the fringe. Yes. It it exists only to oppose Army League largely. It doesn't have any specific own agenda, own no, identity. No, absolutely, absolutely. Army League has. And yeah. if you go back, and I'm doing this work on trying to trace mm -hmm. Army League. And I see Amelie can be traced only if you go back to the absolutely older yeah. history of, of yeah. uh, okay. partition Afsan, of Bengal. Have to, if you could hold that thought a second, Afsan, we are going to take a break. Uh, we'll be back. Please join us after the break. Thank you. Welcome back. Uh, this is Straight Talk. I am Zafar Subhan in conversation with Afsan Chaudhry. So, Afsan, we were talking about the political situation uh, with the upcoming elections. Now, one of the things which, of course, has happened over recent times is uh, Mainul Hussain and Dr. Zafrullah, who are also part of the new alliance which has come up, have both faced legal troubles. Yeah. What do you make of those? Yeah. Mm, thanks. I think uh, clearly the government uh, was given an opportunity. I mean, you can't just say that the government cracked down on them. Could be unfair, could be everything. But the fact remains is that the things that it was said yeah. and the things that were stated yeah. were quite serious. Mm -hmm. And I think as senior people, they should have been a little more careful. Yeah, I mean, I think both things, as you say, they gave themselves the op uh, they gave the uh, the government, the government opening. Did. they did, but I think people have been somewhat surprised by the level of uh, yeah. uh, repercussion, yeah. which perhaps is uh, somewhat unprecedented. Yeah, I also, and I have said this, why does everyone have to do party politics? Mm. I mean, Dr. Zafrul Chaudhry has enormous achievements, he's one of the most respected persons in this country, one who has got solid concrete achievements, but now one after another, every day a case is being filed. He is being harassed, his work is being harassed, his university, his, his uh, health center, his medicine. He has to take responsibility for that also. I mean, suppose he was not in politics. Would he be making much of a difference? Mm. He wouldn't. He doesn't even have a party. I mean, remain as an advisor, talk sensibly, remember who you are, and, and, and act accordingly. He should have realized who, who was he. What kind of a difference is he making to the Army League BNP equation? You know, because this is, of course, something you've always talked about. Is unfortunately in this country we always talk about a Army League BNP as though that's the be all and end all of everything in this country. When there's so much really going on, yes, and for exactly. your average person, perhaps you know whether Army League is in power, BNP is in power, and life goes on. Yes, there's absolutely. There's so much else absolutely. happening. Absolutely, absolutely. I think this is the mistake this elite class makes, and right. this professional elite or whatever you're going to call them. Yeah. They at some point of 
of the day decide that this is the space where we are going to play yeah. and this is the most important space. I think Zafur Labai's most important space uh, was the health sector. Yeah. And he should have stayed there. But I'm going to come back to sort of the issue. I mean, I think, it's, as I said, it's to do with, for me, the issue is the, the level of proportionality. And the interesting thing about his, his, his misspeaking is now, of course, we've got the new broadcast law, which uh, a while back was the Digital Security Act, which, of course, is a member of the Editors' Council. Uh, we all opposed it. And, uh, and now we've got the broadcast law, which says that if you, if you, yeah, yeah. If you broadcast some, uh, something on air, that seems like, you know, this... Because, you know, people do misspeak on air. Yeah, uh, I think, happen. of course, of course. It's, it's extremely... Uh, I mean, you can use it. Yeah. And the, and the, and the uh, strategy is to have a case filed somewhere else and you can't go there, therefore yeah. a warrant is issued and then you're arrested. Yeah. No question that, you know, this is really o overdoing. With a person like Zafar Lachow, I have looked at the file when I was yeah. working on 71, is that what he had achieved, the, uh, the commander-in-chief of the Bangladesh Army yes. had actually recommended a special medal for Zafar Lachow. Sure. He, there is no credibility, no spot on his credibility up till now. Yeah, and, and you couldn't put him. I mean, yeah. the government, I'm sure, could have you know, you know, gone and done all the things they're doing now. But now it's three months to elections. He's taking a political position. With all the overdoing this government is doing with Zafur Labhai, mm -hmm. I still think Zafur Labhai also has to be more responsible. Mm -hmm. This is a message we all should get. I mean, if I am going to be in a government in a situation where I am at bay, mm -hmm. and I'm going to say, no, I'm going to fight you, do you expect the other pers person on the other side to say, no, I'm going to let you go mm. just because of that? No, you're yeah. not going to. This is real. Okay. For Monul Hussein, the history is longer. Mm. Because, uh, yes, of course, all the way yeah, back to... Go, goes to 1975. Yes. And joining Democratic League after 1975 is not something some Hasina, Sheikh Hasina... Well, there's 75 to, and then, of course, there's his role the, in 111. The so one these 11. are the two... Clearly, you know. I mean, despite the fact that they are so family and they are so close, I mean, Manik Mia's yeah. son is something. But Manik Mia's son is also someone who you have to be Manik Mia's son. I mm. mean, um, in my work on 71, I see Sheikh Mujib always being approached, you know, sometimes through Manik Mia or being told, okay, this, please discuss it this with Manik Mia. Manik Mia is the great iconic figure of um, political activist journalism. Of Clearly, a great deal of respect. And I think when Barista Manur Hussain um, disagreed and did not vote and resigned from the parliament before the Fourth Amendment was passed, I think it's very significant that uh, nothing happened to him. And he once did tell me in a private conversation, but he knew that he's Manik Mia's son. Yeah. I mean, that kind of level of relationship Sheikh sure. Mujib had with Manik Mia. But since then, the problem with Manur Hussain is that he f seems to feel that you know he needs a, he needs more political recognition. His brother gets more <laughs> ministerships. He doesn't. So I think well, there are lots of factors have contributed. But Sheikh Hasina is not going to look very happily at a person who had joined the Democratic League, headed by Khandukar Mushtaq, whom she holds responsible for the killing of her father. You're yes. already gone at several. No, I mean uh, that's uh, that's that that's a yeah. very and, big and, thing. And, yes. and though he didn't have anything to do with the killing, yeah. the fact remains that you did join someone who had this large gaggle of killers, yes. you know, with him. This is the point that's which people forget. And then 111, Sheikh Hasina was being tried. Khalid the Jay was being tried, and you were with the military. Now yeah. you were you were also let go by the military point is, if only these people would remember, this is the reality. I'm not saying it's a good reality. Mm -hmm. I'm not. But I'm saying this is the reality. And then you take a step forward. You take a step. You step on the toe of a very powerful giant. We haven't had a government as powerful as this government even during the time of Sheikh there's a There's a wonderful line in the TV show The Wire. I'm not sure if you're familiar with it. It's no. a marvelous show about uh, uh, Baltimore. And... Um, they, uh, the line is, if you come at the king, you best not miss. And <laughs> I agree. This is the thing. You, you got it right. Absolutely. You don't fight the king and, he, and you don't hit the king and you give the king a chance to hit you back. You expect the king to say, no, you missed. I'm sorry and all that. Yeah. I think so, no. Absolutely. you're playing power games. 
then mm. play by the rules of the power game. Yeah. This is what is going to happen. Face okay. it. Don't Absolutely. give excuses. Okay. Don't ask for excuses. Okay. Afsan Bhai. So we're going to take another break. We will be back. This is Zafar Saban with Afsan Chodri on Straight Talk. We will see you after the break. Thank you. Welcome back to Straight Talk with Zafar Subhan. I'm here today in conversation with Mr. Afsan Chaudhary. Um, let's switch it up a little, Afsan. We right. can, uh, I want to talk a little bit about, of course, the other major issue which is occurring here in Bangladesh and in many ways is uh, perhaps more important than politics, which are more evanescent in move yeah. from here and there. Let's talk about the Rohingya crisis right. on our southeastern border, which is the great humanitarian crisis right. of you know, of this of this time, I would actually say. I yeah. think the UN has lately, they've you know, certainly called it ethnic cleansing, and a, late, a report has come out, you know, saying that actually it's moved from ethnic cleansing to genocide, and I would yeah. certainly use that word. Yeah. But for our perspective, my issue is that, uh, you know, what can we do about this, and where does this situate Bangladesh in the geopolitical framework? Because, of course, we've got India here, we've got China there. How does one address this issue in what part, what role are these other large countries, the big players in the region playing? Yeah, thanks. Uh, I think we, we uh, were completely taken on our ways. I think it seems that way. But at the same time, we also were very naive. Mm. Th because if you look at the history of Rohingyas, then you will see that the Myanmar government or the Burmans, whoever, have been trying to throw them out from pretty long time and yeah. I was I was looking at some documents I had found from, yeah. from the uh, pre war first world war where they're saying the Myanmar government is trying to throw uh, Rohingyas Yes. Now but this is a long-standing long project standing of theirs. Thing. And, I, and, uh, and in recent memory, there's the 1970s, yeah. there was the 1990s. This is just in recent memory. Yeah. And mm. this is what, what, what really puzzles me. Because it is not a question of this government failing. I mean, they, they, usually the discussion becomes, what did this government do? What did this government do? Sure. I would say, what did the foreign policy and the security establishment do? Because you mm. go back to 1997, you go back to 1992, then you go back to 17 and 18. You had a very long period of being, people being pushed out. What did you do? I have said that we should have closed the borders. It sounds very cruel. If mm -hmm. it is not illegal, then we should close the borders because it is our security also. Sure. Something we are not always ready well, you to know, the, uh, the, the The unspoken subtext of all of this, to be perfectly blunt, is you know we ask ourselves why and how is the Myanmar government and army able to do what it's done over the last year. And a big part of the reason we never talk about this is that, you know, the reason there were repatriations in the 70s and there were repatriations in the 1990s is because that is something that we could, as Bangladeshis, insist upon uh, because we actually had the power and the military might to do so. Right now, for, uh, right now, because of the Myanmar's superiority, and it's largely its air superiority in terms of their air force, we, you know, we, I think um, we, there's not much the Bangladeshi uh, we can do. And they know this, and that is what has emboldened them. But I think this is what you, this is right. I mean, these are things which we it never occurred to us, from a strategic point of view, that this is something we needed to plan for, and the planning just hasn't been there. And like I said, it's not just the last five or ten years under this government. It's not been there previously as well. Yeah. So I think we've just never looked in that. Uh, you know, Bangladesh has never seen itself as a geopolitical play, and maybe it's time for us to start. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I've written about it. In, in many cases, and I've yeah. talked about it, I, I took a semester on this issue, yes. and it becomes clear that, you know, whether we like it or not, we have now become part of at least regional uh, geopolitics, yeah. and we don't seem to be aware of this. Yeah. Now, if you look at China, China itself, and I have had conversations with the Chinese, and they are also, you know, they realize they even they are not fully free. Sure. I mean, they can't just tell Myanmar government, you know, go and withdraw and take back all the Rohingyas. Rohingyas are probably not going back. The mm. Myanmar military has used the Rohingyas, kicking them out, 
as a way of becoming more popular in their own country. It's a very popular move yeah. in that country. So what has happened, that has put a lot of pressure on the civilian government. So the Myanmar military doesn't want to give up any power to the civilian. That's their internal problem and Rohingyas were kind of the scapegoats which could be used very sure. e easily. Apart from whatever people think, the government would think twice. The other part is what you mentioned which is very specific that we are in a less of a negotiating position. Right. Third thing is that if you look at the bilateral um, treaty or yeah. whatever we did, the point is we have always assumed that the United Nations was going, to be, was going to solve our problem. United Nations is toothless. And on that note, uh, Afsan, we have to leave it, but it's Thank been you. wonderful talking Thank to you. you. Thank you for giving us this time. I've really enjoyed this conversation. I hope Thank to see you again shortly. Thank you. This has been Straight Talk with Zafar Zaban. My guest has been Afsan Chaudhry. I hope you've enjoyed this conversation and I hope you'll tune in next week for more of the same. Thank you very much.